Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome to the Kaiser Report. The war continues. The financial war. We called it. We predicted it. Now we're in it. Stacey Herbert. Max Kaiser, yes, this financial war is being played out, and not only the propaganda being perpetrated by the mainstream financial media, but also in prices. That's the important thing to look at here. First, I want to show you a cartoon from the Chattanooga Times Free Press by Clay Bennett. And the title of the cartoon is Economic Trends. Yep, pitchforks up eight and three quarters, and torches up seven and a half. Yes, the war plays out on the big board, Max. Dissent is up. As we've been saying on this show for many, many months, and we've been talking about for years, you need to monetize dissent, and you need to get it higher, represented as a price, because it's a price propaganda, so you need to price your dissent first and then get the price higher. I know you Occupy Wall Street people can wrap your mind around this. Just open your mind and think. Yes, and one of the elements of this, why pitchforks, the price is going up and soaring on the big board there is, as President Obama had famously said to the bankers, I'm the only thing that stands between you and the pitchforks. But the fact is that there has been no justice, right? No, no, none of these bankers have been delivered to justice. And so it ends up being pitchforks and beheadings. No, I don't understand why in a country that's so eager to execute people, like down in the state of Texas, they, they kill hundreds of people down there for trivial crimes. Why are they so shy about going after bankers who are committing unbelievably horrid, wretched financial crimes of rape and terror? Surely there's a hot chair or a lethal injection or a guillotine blade for them. Now let's look at how, again, this war is fought in prices. Bulls bust out in final hour. Dow is up 377 points from low on bank reversal. So markets soared suddenly in the last half hour. And apparently the cause, according to Zero Hedge, is FT causes massive short squeeze with mother of all end of day rumors. Well, the end of day rumor was yet another potential bailout for Europe. But again, it was a rumor, and if you actually read past the headline on the FT, apparently it was like, well, this is, these are just discussions. There's no real plan. It's so sad because obviously for the 99% of Americans who are not directly tied to larceny on Wall Street, the number that they would want to see go up is the number of jobs. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have all these millions of Americans rooting for stocks to go up, mm -hmm. which only benefit a few guys on Wall Street, is absurd. And it just shows you the propaganda is brilliant. Uh, that higher prices at the end of the day somehow are good for us. This is a, an amazing triumph of propaganda in the 21st century, tying prices to uh, a Pavlovian type response amongst the population. Yeah, and again, it's war, and this is being fought intentionally. This, these are intentional moves. As the headline said, there was a massive short squeeze. So they were trying to destroy anybody that would bet against the markets. Yes, there are professional hedge fund managers and others who take these enormous sales, short sales, short positions against the market. They're fighting the government who's got their infinite credit capacity to hit them with buy programs and automated program trading. So you've got one group of hedge funds, a few hundred guys who have several trillion dollars in credit versus the federal government. And they're several trillion dollars in credit. The people in the middle, the 99% of the world that is not on either one of those two camps, are suffering and asked to accept austerity measures that get worse every single day. Now, I just spoke of people who short the market. Anonymous analytics. Acquiring information through unconventional means. This is apparently anonymous hackers set up activist hedge fund. This is fantastic because anonymous has picked up the ball. You know, we introduced the concept of marrying short sales and market activity with activism and boycotts. If you Google Karma Bank, you'll find the history of this. It goes back to 2004 when back in London we had this hedge fund set up. And um, so this is really a fantastic development for the Occupy Wall Street campaign because it gives 
the occupiers some uh, f some real firepower. So you go to a gunfight with a gun. You don't go to a gunfight with a knife. Actually, the FT interviewed somebody from the anonymous group, and they referred to the fact that Occupy Wall Street doesn't have any real firepower. And they're saying th the the only thing that matters is the share price. And this is why they're creating this fund, which they've published a 38-page report on Chowda Modern Agriculture, which is apparently one of the biggest agriculture producers in, um, in China. And so they claimed that th they provided evidence of one of the Hong Kong Exchange's largest and longest running frauds. And then their report, according to this article, is prefaced with a legalistic disclaimer and unusually for an activist group states that it will profit from any collapse in Chowda's share price. That's right. I'm so proud of Anonymous. Thank you guys for, you know, fighting the good fight. Uh, they should uh, contact Reggie Middleton and get his work on J.P. Morgan. Uh, go after J.P. Morgan with your short sales, your naked short sales, hopefully, and take that stock price down to zero, profit wildly, and share the goodies. But imagine had they existed and released this information about all these CDOs, for example, that for years nobody knew other than the bankers themselves who had packaged these fraudulent securities. Only they had the advantage of being able to short those securities they were creating because they knew themselves that as having packaged it that they were toxic. Imagine if Anonymous had been able to release, as they've done here, the inside emails that these people, like Goldman Sachs, we know were referring to beep deals. So imagine how they, they released those in 2005 when these uh, fraudulent securities were being packaged. Right. Uh, while Goldman Sachs was shorting the products that they themselves created, knowing that they were toxic and worthless, a hedge fund run by a group like Anonymous could have also been selling short those CDOs and other toxic products. But the profits that were generated in the Anonymous hedge fund could have been distributed to building up the Occupy Wall Street campaign around the world and to go to war with the Wall Street terrorists. So they have the potential to make billions and billions of dollars in a hedge fund like this. This is an untapped market, and there's very little correlation. The problem in the hedge fund industry right now is that everything is correlated with everything else, so everyone's making the exact same bet. Apple Computer, for example, is one of the biggest holdings in over 180 hedge funds. They're making the exact same bet. There's nobody doing something different, except now you've got a major player. They should make billions and billions of dollars. What they do with the profits, it's obvious where the profits should go. They should feed uh, Indian people who have been viciously attacked by Coca-Cola, feed workers in Colombia who were murdered by Coca-Cola. They should uh, do stuff and be counter-capitalists, reverse capitalists. Again, so Anonymous will be vilified for this, just as Alessio Rastani was vilified for not being a too-big-to-fail trader. Now look at this headline, which won't get any attention and shock from the likes of Fox and Friends. Meet the Texan investor who made millions from the credit crunch, and now he's betting Europe will go down the drain. So first he made money on the subprime mortgage crisis because he believed as the subprime market collapsed that the financial crisis was being hidden by rich Western governments. So because of this, he's now buying credit default swaps on places like Greece, and he'll make hundreds of thousands of dollars if Greece defaults. Now, he's attacking these countries with these credit default swaps. He doesn't own their debt, he's just betting against them. Is he vilified? No. No, because he knows how to play the game. He, he pays off politicians. He, like in the Murdoch enterprise, totally corrupt. He, he, he will pay off the Tories with Cameron and Osborne, completely corrupt. So therefore, his marauding in the markets and making money by shorting stocks are, is considered a necessary lubricant for markets. Whereas Rastani, who simply is doing some, the exact same thing but on a smaller scale, he's like a home version of a financial terrorist, he's held up as being, oh my God, this guy is absolutely detrimental to our operating economy and he should be vilified, but he's just a low-playing, low low-level punk. This guy is a full-fledged global financial terrorist. But Cameron, who endorses this type of looting, but puts kids who loot a bottle of milk in jail, he, he's been shown now to be completely duplicitous. And, you know, let me just quickly aside that, uh, again, with the anonymous hedge fund, the billions and billions of profits that they make, obviously, if they buy physical silver with that, it would jack the price up to 60 70 80 90 $100 an ounce, which, of course, would benefit everybody. And could take down J.P. Morgan, because I want to bring up this, this, this 
Texas investor is Kyle Bass. Kyle Bass is the one that ended up collapsing Bear Stearns, which was handed to J.P. Morgan, which was then delivered all of those shorts on the silver market. So Kyle Bass, remember, he was the one that was speaking to CNBC and told them uh, that he started the rumor that he couldn't uh, get the payoff on the, his credit default swap on Bear Stearns. But in fact, the next morning it was paid off. Yeah. So he's inside manipulating markets. He's a financial terrorist causing human misery, death and deprivation. But Cameron and Obama are on their knees telling him he's the god that they worship. And meanwhile, when it's exposed that some low-level people are doing the same thing, oh my god, well, how can we survive with this? Yeah, if you're not taking down banks in order to hand them to J.P. Morgan for pennies on the dollar, then you're the bad guy. Now I want to look at some more, uh, you brought up precious metals, some more propaganda against the population. Here's from the FT. It's an opinion piece. Gold bugs beware. The bubble is finally bursting. This is from a professor at Boston University, and he says, gold's recent volatility is spooking investors and destroying demand. He claims, even though... Uh, imports to Turkey up 644%. Imports to India, the biggest consumer of gold in the world, up many, many times over. So wh where is this guy? He's just pulling a, a fabricated idea out of his bottom. Well, again, it's, it's price propaganda. He is seeing a price fall as commensurate with demand fall. Demand for gold and silver is increasing. The fact that the price is not going up is because these markets are manipulated by the Financial Times and the people who support the Financial Times and the people who support the corrupt banking system. That's the unimpeachable truth. And then a part of his propaganda is he's saying that if gold is falling in a weak economy, imagine if it eventually moves from chaos to prosperity, how bad gold will do. <laughs> exactly. But as we said at the top of the show, the price of pitchforks is going higher. In the world we see around us, in the Occupy Wall Street, in the Occupy Oz, in the Occupy Melbourne, in the Occupy Los Angeles, in the Occupy the City of London, you're, you're, that's the price of pitchforks. Justice has not been delivered, so there will be no prosperity. This guy just doesn't get it. Yes, if Occupy Wall Street, hedge fund, tells everybody in the world, in all these cities who are protesting to start buying silver, physical silver, one ounce at a time, and they themselves are buying it billions of dollars at a time due to their short sales and naked short sales of corrupt institutions like J.P. Morgan and other banks and other companies that are committing financial fraud and financial terrorism. Then the total dynamic of the global market shifts away from the people getting abused. They then become the rulers against the class of people that are doing the abusing. Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away. Much more coming your way, so stay right there. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else, you hear or see some other part of it, and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. Hi, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to London and speak with Professor Steve Keen. Steve is the author of Debunking Economics, which has just been re-released as Debunking Economics 2, The Naked Emperor Dethroned. Steve Keen, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Good to be here and good to be holding the, the hard cover of my new edition of Debunking Economics. All right, Steve Keen, you've been in Europe for the past week. Uh, while extreme volatility has returned again to the sovereign debt and equity markets, is this a classic mm. Minsky moment type collapse action? If so, tell us what a Minsky moment is. Well, it's actually a, a Minsky moment doesn't do Minsky justice. I think it's more like, this is more likely this is the Minsky millennium because this process began with the debt bubble that took 50 or 60 years to build up in America 
uh, and will take something like about 10, at least 10 to 15, maybe 20 years to unwind if we go through the same sort of inane policies that politicians are currently following by, you know, following the advice of the morons whose theories I wrote this book about, you now classical economists. So um, it's, a, it's a permanent sh uh, shock. And the, the Minsky moment comes down to saying that there can be a period of uh, extreme rational exuberance pervading through the economy, what, what Minsky calls euphoric expectations, leading capitalists in general, but in particular Ponzi schemers, Ponzi merchants, people who make money by gambling and rising asset prices, to take out more and more debt and get to the stage where there's such a level of debt laden on society that no one wants to take any more at one point. And when the debt stops growing, you go from a period of growing debt, boosting demand, to reducing debt, uh, under, uh, cutting demand, and that period of deleveraging is the beginning of a Minsky moment because we've got such a huge level of private debt run up in this speculative bubble in America, particularly in, in the last 20 years, but as I said, really going back 60 years, it could take one or two decades for that level of debt to be driven down. So it's not the Minsky moment, it's the Minsky millennium. Right, and uh, basically what we're seeing now is the revelation that this debt-fueled so-called growth is nothing more than an enormous Ponzi scheme. Now, Steve Keen, I'm going to be in Ireland next month at the Kilconomics Festival, mm -hmm. and I'm sharing the stage with Jeffrey Sachs. Whoa, that'll be fun. Who's got to be considered a classic economist from academia, somebody who, in your book, I'm sure, would qualify someone to debunk. What should I bring to the stage when I'm on stage with Jeffrey Sachs? Your thoughts? What you could ask him is, what, is he, what does he think about what happened in Russia? because Jeffrey Sachs was a major proponent of what they call the shock therapy approach for Russia that said that the way to go the transition from a socialist system to a capitalist system was to do it as quickly as possible in the belief that the market would instantly jump from a, uh, wherever it was in the socialist system to a nice equilibrium of the market economy. And the original pl pr plan that he pushed through uh, was, was supposed to take a 500-day period to go from socialism to free market capitalism. Now, in fact, that wasn't fast enough for them. They made it 150. 50 days. And I was in Russia just recently speaking with uh, people at the University of Humanities there and uh, one of the, the, the head of the department, Mikhail, uh, told me that a large number of his colleagues died in that transition because what happened was the actual change from um, socialist set prices to free market prices occurred, was set in one day. I think he said it was the 1st of January or the 2nd of January and so they woke up to find their wages hadn't changed but prices had increased by a factor of four. So I asked Jeffrey Sachs about that because he certainly, you know, he was a proponent of that. He's now changed his spots and he's joined in with Bono and gone, you know, socially progressive, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and give him credit for that. But to ask him to honestly discuss what happened, what advice did he give prior to the uh, transition in Russia, and what happened because of the transition, and was it a move to equilibrium or chaos? Okay, so Jeffrey Sachs in Russia with his fault theories resulted in deaths. People died because yep. of his yep. adherence to these uh, um, orthodoxies and economics, which have been proven to be a shambolic. Now, um, on Wall Street, there's the Occupy Wall Street protest because a lot of the bankers on Wall Street who are creating these financially engineered products that are based on equally faulty economic assumptions are also causing death and disease all over the world, uh, in the United States and around the world. Uh, what should be the punishment for economics and Wall Street traders and bankers who end up, vis-a-vis -vis their policies, killing people? Uh, one of my favorite cartoons is the Wiley uh, non sequitur cartoon, and at one stage there's a cartoon with a bunch of people being uh, dragged down, uh, you know, obviously in hell, leading down towards the ultimate punishment, and there's the devil standing over a, a uh, lecture theatre saying, the eternal economic seminar, and one person, and one, one, one convict says, oh God, it's worse than I thought. I think they should listen to their own stuff interminably in a sensory deprivation chamber. That might, might uh, get them to pay back for the for the nonsense they've unleashed. The crazy thing is, a lot of the Wall Street traders knew they were scamming. There's plenty of fraud, as you know, in the finance sector. The academic economists who push this stuff out actually, generally speaking, believe it and actually think they're doing good. And I have a little analogy that I've in included in the uh, second edition of the book from one of my old school teachers, a brilliant uh, philosopher, as it turned out. He uh, let us have free discussions in what were supposed to be religion classes, and we were discussing a particular politician back when I was about 18 years old, 17 years old. And one of the other students in the class said to about this guy, well, at least he's sincere. 
and the whole class chimed in, yeah, yeah, we can't do that, he's too sincere. And the teacher, who normally shut up and didn't say a word, piped up and said, don't overrate sincerity. The most dangerous people and the person you'll meet in your life is the, is the maniac sincerely chasing you down the road with an axe trying to chop your head off in the belief it'll be good for you. Well, that's kind of eventually what neoclassical economists have done. Their naivety has caused this crisis. Yeah, and um, this has uh, been played out recently with uh, in the mainstream media in America covering the the Wall Street occupation and other uh, campaigns going on that while well, the bankers are sincere in their attempts to do something uh, and, and this has resulted in a huge mismatch and even crypto conservatives like John Stewart can't seem to wrap their mind around the fact that they're dealing with quite uh, an opposing force of destruction. Well, let's move back to uh, Europe for a second. Your thoughts on the European Financial Stability Fund, even the proposed, revised, expanded and leveraged version uh, how is this going to save Europe, Steve Keen? Oh, it's going to save it by burying it under the elite yet more debt. I mean, you do need a government sector stimulating the economy when you've got a downturn in the private sector. But this whole thing is trying to solve a debt crisis by issuing more debt. This has got to be paid back. You've got to come back to Michael Hudson's classic phrase in this whole point. Debts that can't be repaid won't be repaid. And what we need is not debt, uh, more and more debt reschedulings and, and leveraging of current levels of rescue into yet more debt that the, the embattled country has to pay. We need to abolish large slabs of this debt that should never have been issued in the first place and it's the finance sector that should wear the pain not the ordinary person in Greece or the rest of Europe. Well yeah I mean look the the debt that was created by these economists and bankers following corrupt theories and their own larcenistic ends are creating the austerity measures that are causing poverty, disease, famine and death. So they're killing people literally there's an, there's an axiomatic relationship more debt equals more death yeah, well, we need something like that. This, we, we, we're still at the phase where we're denying that there's a, a long-term crisis. People are still thinking we're going to come out of this thing, you know, and it's just a case that this, this package will get us over as, thank God that's over, let's move back to the next boom. That's the same attitude they had in 1931 and 32 in the Great Depression. It took them a long time to realise, hell, this is serious, we're stuck here. And it took, it, the, the, the turning point in the political approach to the crisis in the 1930s, which got us out of the Great Depression to some extent, though unfortunately the Second World War played the major role there, was a commission known now as the Pecora Commission, where an absolutely rabid uh, prosecutor went for the head of J.P. Morgan and basically got him and it completely crippled the political power of the bankers at that stage and set the scene for the, for the New Deal and Roosevelt speech about effectively throwing the bankers out of the palace. Uh, we need a political shift like that and in many ways I think there's Occupy Wall Street movement which I now see is replicated in, in my own country with Occupy, uh, Occupy Sydney and Occupy Melbourne and a few others taking up around the world. Uh, that pu public movement may be what's needed to shift the politicians and stop them you know, being in the pockets of the bankers and put the bankers behind bars instead because if, until a few of them end up there the same behavior is going to continue. Yeah, I'm on a mailing list with um, Dylan Radigan, Matt Taibbi um, and others, uh, Bill Black and they're all debating uh, what the demands should be and even if they should make any demands. Uh, but Steve Keen, would you say that a simple demand would be we need a new PCORA Commission? Yes, absolutely. We need somebody with balls running it. I'm Bill Black is my obvious nomination there. Uh, Bill did a brilliant job over the Savings and Loans uh, Commission. He put hundreds of people behind bars who belonged there for fraudulent behaviour in the Savings and Loans crisis. That was a drop in the water compared to what happened since then with the, the dot-com bubble and the subprime. But nobody's gone to jail over it. Now, there's absolutely bucket loads of fraud in the entire system, and you need somebody with the balls to take them on and put people behind bars over this and start breaking down the political power that Wall Street still has. Yeah, Bill Black needs to get medieval on Jamie Dimon's <laughs> All right, let's uh, spend the next uh, minute or so talking about Australia. Uh, you famously have been calling for the Australian real estate market to top out and start a decline. Uh, of all your work, Steve Kane, this is the one prediction that has lagged the others, but it seems as though you're being vindicated. Bring us up to date. Yeah, well, they, they, I made that call about house prices falling 40% over 10 to 15 years uh, in about, I think, August of 2007. And in, in October of 2007, the government brought in what I prefer to call the first-time vendors boost, where rather than giving 
deposit, uh, first home buyers seven thousand Australian dollars as a as a as a deposit towards their first home. They gave them fourteen thousand and twenty one thousand if they bought a new place. And states like Victoria whacked them up to an extra fifteen thousand dollars. So in the case of Victoria, depending on where you bought, you can get a thirty five thousand dollar check from the government simply for saying you're going to go and buy a house. Now that restarted the bubble, which had started to burst at the time. So when I made that call, house prices had fallen about five percent on an annualised basis. From that point, uh, once the, the first home vendors boost kicked in, about $100 billion more borrowed money was injected into the market and house prices rose about another 18% across the country. Now that takes a while for the momentum to turn around and it's finally started turning around and of course the success of the first home vendors boost was by dragging people who are going to buy in 2010 and 2011 into 2008 and 2009 so it actually kicks itself in its own at the end of it, there are just simply aren't that many buyers out there anymore. You're starting to get the flow of new demand being less than the flow of new supply. The prices are too high to discourage people in any way. So the overhang, which is the prelude to a fall in a, in a housing market, is well and truly established now. And we're seeing prices turning down in every market except apparently Sydney, which is still slightly positive over on an annualised basis. But certainly Perth and Brisbane, ironically, the two capitals of the two major mining states, have seen quite sort of substantial falls in prices already and the momentum is well and truly growing. All right, Steve Keen, that's all the time we have. Thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. You're welcome, mate. Pick again. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Steve Keen. Pick up his new book, Debunking Economics, the new expanded version. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.